Chapter Eleven, Mrs. Peterkin's Tea Party. Twas important to have a tea party, as they had all been invited by everybody, the Bromwicks, the Tremletts, and the Gibbonses. It would be such a good chance to pay off some of their old debts. Now that the lady from Philadelphia was back again, and her two daughters, who would be sure to make it all go off well, but as soon as they began to make out their list, they saw there were too many to have at once, for there were but twelve cups and saucers in the best set. There are seven of us to begin with," said Mr. Peterkin. "We need not all drink tea," said Mrs. Peterkin. "I never do," said Solomon John. "The little boys never did." And we could have coffee too," suggested Elizabeth Eliza. "That would take as many cups," objected Agamemnon. "We could use the everyday set for the coffee," answered Elizabeth Eliza. "They are the right shape. Besides," she went on, "they would not all come. Mister and Missus Bromwick, for instance, they never go out." "There are but six cups in the everyday set," said Missus Peterkin. The little boys said there were plenty of saucers, and Mr. Peterkin agreed with Elizabeth Eliza that all would not come. Old Mr. Jeffers never went out. There are three of the Tremletts," said Elizabeth Eliza. "They never go out together. One of them, if not two, will be sure to have the headache. Anne Maria Bromwick would come, and the three Gibbons boys, and their sister Juliana. But the other sisters are out west, and there is but one Osborne." It really did seem safe to ask everybody. They would be sorry after it was all over that they had not asked more. We have the cow," said Mrs. Peterkin. "So there will be as much cream and milk as we shall need, and our own pig," said Agamemnon. "I am glad we had it salted, so we can have plenty of sandwiches." "I will buy a chest of tea," exclaimed Mr. Peterkin. "I have been thinking of a chest for some time." Mrs. Peterkin thought a whole chest would not be needed. It was as well to buy the tea and coffee by the pound. But Mr. Peterkin determined on a chest of tea and a bag of coffee. So they decided to give the invitations to all. It might be a stormy evening, and some would be prevented. The lady from Philadelphia and her daughters accepted, and it turned out a fair day, and more came than were expected. Anne Maria Bromwick had a friend staying with her, and brought her over, for the Bromwicks were opposite neighbors, and the Tremletts had a niece and Mary Osborne an aunt, that they took the liberty to bring. The little boys were at the door to show in the guest, and as each set came in to the front gate, they ran back to tell their mother that more were coming. Mrs. Peterkin had grown dizzy with counting those who had come. And trying to calculate how many were to come, and wondering why there were always more and never less, and whether the cups would go round. The three Tremletts all came with their niece. They all had had their headaches the day before, and were having that banged feeling you always have after a headache. So they all sat at the same side of the room on the long sofa. All the Jefferses came, though they had sent uncertain answers. Old Mr. Jeffers had to be helped in with his cane by Mr. Peterkin. The Gibbons boys came and would stand just outside the parlor door, and Juliana appeared afterward with the two other sisters unexpectedly home from the west. Got home this morning, they said, and so glad to be in time to see everybody. A little tired, to be sure, after forty-eight hours in a sleeping car. Forty-eight, repeated Mrs. Peterkin. And wondered if there were forty-eight people, and why they were all so glad to come, and whether all could sit down. Old Mister and Missus Bromwick came. They thought it would not be neighborly to stay away. They insisted on getting into the most uncomfortable seats. Yet there seemed to be seats enough, while the Gibbons boys preferred to stand. But they never could sit round a tea table. Elizabeth Eliza had thought they all might have room at the table, and Solomon John and the little boys could help in the waiting. It was a great moment when the lady from Philadelphia arrived with her daughters. Mister Peterkin was talking to Mister Bromwick, who was a little deaf. 
The Gibbons boys retreated a little farther behind the parlor door. Mrs. Peterkin hastened forward to shake hands with the lady from Philadelphia, saying, Four Gibbons girls and Mary Osborne's aunt, that makes nineteen. And now— it made no difference what she said, for there was such a murmuring of talk that any words suited, and the lady from Philadelphia wanted to be introduced to the Bromwicks. It was delightful for the little boys. They came to Elizabeth Eliza and asked, Can't we go and ask more? Can't we fetch the Larkins? Oh, dear, no, answered Elizabeth Eliza. I can't even count them. Mrs. Peterkins found time to meet Elizabeth Eliza in the side entry to ask if there were going to be cups enough. "'I have set Agamemnon in the front entry to count,' said Elizabeth Eliza, putting her hand to her head. The little boys came to say that the Maberleys were coming. "'The Maberleys!' exclaimed Elizabeth Eliza. "'I never asked them!' "'It is your father's doing,' cried Mrs. Peterkin. "'I do believe he asked everybody he saw,' and she hurried back to her guests. What if father really has asked everybody? Elizabeth Eliza said to herself, pressing her head again with her hand. There were the cow and the pig, but if they all took tea or coffee, or both, the cups would not go round. Agamemnon returned in the midst of her agony. He had not been able to count the guests. They moved about so, they talked so, and it would not look well to appear to count. What shall we do? exclaimed Elizabeth Eliza. "'We are not a family for an emergency,' said Agamemnon. "'What do you suppose they did in Philadelphia at the exhibition, when there were more people than cups and saucers?' asked Elizabeth Eliza. "'Could not you go and inquire? I know the lady from Philadelphia is talking about the exhibition, and telling how she stayed at home to receive friends, and they must have had trouble there.' Could not you just go in and ask, just as if you wanted to know? Agamemnon looked into the room, but there were too many talking with the lady from Philadelphia. If we could only look into some book, he said, the encyclopedia or the dictionary. They are such a help sometimes. At this moment he thought of his great triumphs of great men that he was reading just now. He had not reached the lives of Stevenson's or any of the men of modern times. He might skip over them. He knew they were men for emergencies. He ran up to his room and met Solomon John coming down with chairs. That is a good thought, said Agamemnon. I will bring down more upstairs chairs. No, said Solomon John. Here are all that can come down. The rest of the bedroom chairs match bureaus, and they will never do. Agamemnon kept on to his own room to consult his books. If only he could invent something on the spur of the moment. A set of bedroom furniture, that in an emergency could be turned into parlor chairs. It seemed an idea, and he sat himself down to his table and pencils, when he was interrupted by the little boys, who came to tell him that Elizabeth Eliza wanted him. The little boys had been busy thinking. They proposed that the tea-table, with all the things on it, should be pushed into the front room, where the company were, and those could take cups who could find cups. But Elizabeth Eliza feared it would not be safe to push so large a table. It might upset and break what china they had. Agamemnon came down to find her pouring out tea in the back room. She called to him, Agamemnon, you must bring Mary Osborne to help, and perhaps one of the Gibbons boys would carry round some of the cups. And so she began to pour out and to send round the sandwiches and the tea and the coffee. Let things go as far as they could. The little boys took the sugar and cream. As soon as they have done drinking, bring back the cups and the saucers to be washed, she said to the Gibbons boys and the little boys. This was an idea of Mary Osborne's. But what was their surprise, that the more they poured out, the more cups they seemed to have. Elizabeth Eliza took the coffee, and Mary Osborne the tea. Amanda brought fresh cups from the kitchen. I can't understand it, Elizabeth Eliza said to Amanda. Do they come to you, round through the piazza? Surely there are more cups than there were. Her surprise was greater when some of them proved to be coffee cups that matched the set, and they never had had coffee cups. Solomon John came in at this moment, breathless with triumph. 
Solomon John, Elizabeth Eliza exclaimed, I cannot understand the cups. It is my doing, said Solomon John, with an elevated air. I went to the lady from Philadelphia in the midst of her talk. What do you do in Philadelphia when you haven't enough cups? Borrow of my neighbors, she answered as quick as she could. She must have guessed, interrupted Elizabeth Eliza. That may be, said Solomon John, but I whispered to Anne Maria Bromwick. She was standing by, and she took me straight over into their closet, and old Mr. Bromwick bought this set just where we bought ours, and they had a coffee set, too. You mean where our father and mother bought them? We were not born, said Elizabeth Eliza. It is all the same, said Solomon John. They match exactly. So they did, and more and more came in. Elizabeth Eliza exclaimed, and Agamemnon says we are not a family for emergencies. Anne Maria was very good about it, said Solomon John, and quick, too, and old Mrs. Bromwick has kept all her set of two dozen coffee and teacups. Elizabeth Eliza was ready to faint with delight and relief. She told the Gibbons boys by mistake, instead of Agamemnon, and the little boys, she almost let fall the cups and saucers she took in her hand. No trouble now. She thought of the cow, and she thought of the pig, and she poured on. No trouble except about the chairs. She looked into the room. All seemed to be sitting down, even her mother. No, her father was standing, talking to Mr. Jeffers, but he was drinking coffee, and the Gibbons boys were handing things around. The daughters of the lady from Philadelphia were sitting on shawls on the edge of the window that opened upon the piazza. It was a soft, warm evening, and some of the young people were on the piazza. Everybody was talking and laughing, except those who were listening. Mr. Peterkin broke away to bring back his cup and another for more coffee. "'It is a great success, Elizabeth Eliza,' he whispered. "'The coffee is admirable, and plenty of cups. We asked none too many. I should not mind having a tea-party every week.' Elizabeth Eliza sighed with relief as she filled his cup. It was going off well. There were cups enough, but she was not sure she could live over another such hour of anxiety. And what was to be done after tea?